All right, so when you guys think about filmmaking or filmmakers, you usually think about people that are gonna be behind the camera or maybe a director. And oftentimes you overlook some of the other positions that it takes to make a full feature film. Now, I've spent a lot of time in the camera department. I've either been the DP or an AC or even a camera operator. But in today's video, I spent five days in a completely new position, a country that I don't live in. And an actual fact, I didn't know what I was doing, but we got a little bit better. I also got threatened at a Jersey Mike's and I gave myself a black eye. That all sounds like a lot, but uh, we'll get into it. Now there's two things that I love doing, and it's one, working on set, and two is finding any excuse to move out of Toronto in order to have a new environment, and also because it got cold. Now, Lucas and Armando did call me up to work on one of the films that they were working on, No Vacancy. But instead of working the camera department as a gimbal operator or as a first AC or even the director of photography, I had a little bit of a different position. Now, I was going to be the key grip on set for the shoot over the course of the week, and some guys might actually ask what a key grip is. Now, in the G and E team, the grip and electric team, there's going to be your gaffer, your best boy, and people that are going to have to do with a lot of the lighting equipment going to be on set. But in terms of rigging that lighting equipment, equipment or getting different rigs for cameras, not necessarily building up the cage, but just how you want to fix the camera for the shot, that's where the grip team is going to be. And the key grip is going to be somebody that's going to manage that entire team as a department head. But I'm also not going to be doing it alone because I'm going to have this guy. The best boy essentially is just the gaffer's best friend on the lighting side of the grip and electric department. I'm going to be working alongside the gaffer to make sure that the lighting is in place and then Kofi here is going to be on the grip side with stands frames, etc. Now, that all sounds really nice and fun, and I actually kind of sound like I have confidence saying that, but here's the thing. I had no idea what I was doing on day one. Now, you might want to be a little bit safer while you're on set. When I was trying to put some stuff over here to put on standby, I might have found the tree, and trees in California are a little bit harder than Canadian ones, so I actually gave myself a bit of a cut, and I really hope it doesn't get infected. But we have things on standby, we're getting our first shots ready, and now we're gonna get things rolling. The fun twist about getting brought onto this shoot was the fact that I have never been in the g and &E department. I've, I've never been a grip, I've never been a gaffer, I've definitely never been a key grip where I have to manage all of those people. So this is gonna be a new experience for me and coming into a different country where I'm not working with my own grip truck. And also what's interesting is that the naming conventions on some of the equipment in California is a little bit different than Toronto. I, I like to be a very direct person. When I need something on set, I call it exactly what it is. It doesn't really have a code name and whatever I bought on Amazon or B&H, that's the thing that I'm calling it. So if I need myself a C-stand or a combo stand with a grip head, like that's what it says on the Amazon description, that's how I'm asking for it. However, when you go into LA and you're working with somebody else's grip truck and you're working with some of the equipment that they have, they might get different names for some things. For example, the different types of diffusions have number designations instead of just calling it what it is. So when my gaffer or my best boy Brady, who was actually on set with me, was asking for a 251 or a 216 or whatever the case might have been, I honestly thought they were just calling football plays at me and I wasn't sure what I was doing. In fact, for the first time in my filmmaking career, I've never felt less of knowing what I'm doing, especially as a department head, which kind of came with its own challenges. But we move and we started to figure it out throughout the day. Now the structure of these days are pretty straightforward, but they're incredibly long days. And most of the time when you work on a feature film or a commercial, you're gonna be working to 10 to 12 hours a piece. Now we started off with doing our daytime exteriors. We had a couple shots we needed to get. We didn't use a lot of big light fixtures, but we did control the light using bounces or diffusion or using negative fill. Uh, so we just finished lunch. We're getting kind of like the last kind of location in, but we still have a few hours and we still have to shoot, but it's nice because a lot of the grip gear is already inside the location and we're only gonna move over one room. so the most of the work is gonna be done for now until we wrap up. Um, I find one of the more challenging things of the day is like, obviously there's a full film crew here and like we have creators like myself can behind the camera, but it's hard to balance like being part of the crew, but then also doing the creator part of what you were hired to be here for. Like not only my key gripping, but I'm also making this video. So it's kind of hard to balance and both of them. And I'm also security in case Brady gets jumped. So. The hard part is trying to balance all of those roles all at once and choosing which one that you want to dedicate your time to, right? Like if I'm getting a clip right right now and they need a C stand or something like that, like I either have to go and get it or delegate to somebody, but then if I'm delegating it and I'm not paying attention, I kind of feel like I'm being a bad crew member. But then at the same time, if I'm being a good crew member, I'm not making the video that I'm here to make the video for. So 
in terms of the day one thing, it's all about kind of balancing all those things, which in the end, it's gonna help out a lot. We'll talk about it a bit later. Now, I spent a lot of time with the G&E team and I learned a lot despite the fact that I think everybody probably hated me by the end of the set. But I did get to transition a little bit into the camera department as a gimbal operator, mostly because nobody else wanted to hold it without an easy rig. Okay, now in the spirit of lifting and moving heavy things, I don't think anybody else is gonna gimbal operate without an easy rig, which leaves just myself to get one shot on the gimbal because I think I'm gonna look at it. Bringing in our first sponsor that actually helped out make this shoot possible is going to be Irix lenses. Now, I did review these in a previous video, but Irix actually sent us a bunch of different lenses between the 21, the 35, the 45, and the 150. Now, you might be wondering, when you're creating a film, you might want to have a more stylistic look, and using clinical lenses might not be the greatest idea, but that's not exactly the case. Now, I mentioned this in my iRix review, but when you're using clinical lenses, you could use things like diffusion or post-production or your color grading in order to dial in that look. And having a clean canvas out of a clinical lens gives you the flexibility to make it whatever you wanna make it in order to get the look that you're going for. A special shout out to iRix for actually sending these lenses. I use them quite a bit in my workflow and they're really handy. And the fact that we can use something like a one eighth or one quarter per lesson on the front of the glass to get the look that we want means that we're gonna have a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of variety. And honestly, you saw the shots already and they look really good. All right, so it's day two, I'm more awake, I'm more alert, I kinda know what I'm doing a little bit better, so now we can get into the day and we can start having some systems in play and it doesn't take me 20 minutes just to find a combo stand. Now, in terms of the status of our G&E team, Brady was the best boy working alongside Chad, who was our gaffer on the first day, but Brady got a promotion and I stayed exactly in the same place as the key grip. Gaffer today. But it is nice because when we're going to walkie talkie back and forth, if there's something I don't know, I'm a little bit more familiar with Brady because we have a Snapchat streak and Chad I met for the first time. So there's gonna be one less person gonna be mad at me when I don't know what I'm doing. Now there was a little bit of a challenge on the day in terms of rigging up the lights and getting the setup that we needed to. We had to set up something called a day for night, which essentially means that we're still gonna be shooting in the afternoon. The shoot started around two or 3 p.m., but we had to make our interior location look like we were shooting it at nighttime. That way we're gonna be able to get all the shots that we need to because if we only started shooting at night, we just wouldn't have enough time to get what we needed on the shot list. Now, this is gonna have a different combination of things. One thing that we did was use black fabric or duvetine in order to line out the walls and black out the windows. Now, blacking out the windows is one thing, but we did also have to make sure that we had the lighting we wanted and mimicked it from the night before. So what we did was we put the four fixtures across the windows inside of a little tent that we made around the front of the building. And then we used garbage bags on the back to make sure we blacked out the back door because we are still gonna have to deal with some sunlight. If we didn't do that, the lighting would be mixed and would give away the trick. Now, this is actually made really easy by our next sponsor, which is going to be iFootage. Now, I've talked about iFootage a lot, but it wasn't in the capacity of lighting. It was more so on their monopod, which I've done a video before and I'm shooting on right now and I keep talking about it in every single video. However, iFootage came out with a bunch of different lights that we were using on set. We were using their COB light and their RGB panel. We were also using some of the pocket lights in order to have different effects. Even on a professional setup and a feature film with a gigantic crew, these lights still held up. They were great for our day for night setup and we use them quite a bit. They were great for the exterior shots that we got the night before and we were able to use some of the pocket lights for a couple of different effects we wanted to make a little bit more practical and that actually says a lot from lights that are brand new. We actually used a combination of the SL1s to shine out of the window and we also used the panel on the indoors in order to dial in the look that we were going for. Now, after we finished our day for night interiors and our night interiors as well, we had to move outside. We had to move outside for a couple of different shots. Now, once we got through all of our interior shots, we had to do our exteriors, and we did rig up a bunch of lights in order to give the effects that we wanted. However, there's one thing about the California desert that I just didn't know about. Now, coming from Toronto, I assume that everything in California is gonna be warm all the time. Just like you guys think that I ride polar bears and I live in an igloo. Now, one thing that I didn't realize about the California desert is that it gets extremely, extremely cold. Even at nighttime, which in my head, I just didn't think about it getting cold in the desert at night, but it was absolutely freezing. And as somebody that didn't bring a jacket thinking it's gonna be hot all the time, I was a little bit upset with how that goes. So anybody in California, you should have warned me before and now you're all bad friends for not doing so. Now, before we start talking to day three, on the way there, there's kind of a funny story. And it was the first time that I had experience with, uh, well, a Karen. Now, one thing that you're always gonna wanna do before a shoot is you wanna make sure that you eat food. So we stopped over at a Jersey Mike's, which is my first time going, but we showed up a little bit late. 
me, Cam, and Brady, we showed up a little late to get our sandwiches. And while waiting in line, we got called over by the people that we were gonna meet there anyways, and they were waiting in line, so we just joined them because we were all going to order together anyways. Unbeknownst to me, finding out to the local Karens of California, that isn't the best thing in the world. There was a woman behind us in line that saw that as us cutting the line and that we were gonna take up more time and that she was gonna have to wait longer for her sandwiches to be made. So I decided to try to explain to her that there's six of us anyways, and we just showed up late, and regardless if it was just Armando ordering for us or if it was all six of us, it would have taken the same amount of time in order to get the things done. Unfortunately, she didn't like that answer. She decided to tell me that the only reason why we were in the position that we were in were, well, because of the thing that were in between our legs, and if she had one too, uh, we would engage in fisticuffs and it would be a different situation. Me actually thinking that this is a joke because sometimes when people cuss me out, I think they're kidding. Uh, I decided to joke around with her and explain to her that none of those two things are going to be happening in this Jersey Mike's. If you could tell, I'm giving you the very PG rated version of how this interaction went and there's no phone evidence and I can only give you the reactions of everybody else that was there to confirm that I'm not crazy. However, our friend decided to tell us again that if she also had the same appendages between her legs, uh, she would beat my ass and which she didn't because she doesn't have those things. So unfortunately for her, she wasn't able to get her fight in today. And also she didn't get to talk to the manager because they were kind of on our side and they didn't really care the fact that we were gonna order six sandwiches, whether there were six people in line or whether there was one. On top of that, she stormed out of the place saying she was never gonna go there again, to which I reminded her that, well, they get six sandwiches in place of just your one. Maybe shouldn't have done that. Maybe should have been more of an adult, but I'm petty and I don't care. However, that's how the shoot actually started, but it actually got a little bit better. I'm a lot more confident. We have a system going on where we have runners from the truck and people on set to make sure that the exchanges are really efficient. We did do our day for night again with blacking out the windows and setting up different lighting and using the fusion and everything is still gonna be in the same location. We just have to move things around a little bit. But one thing that we did was because we had the hands on deck and we knew what we were doing, we knew exactly what equipment to get on time and we were able to get things done and make the lighting team's job a lot easier. This is where I ran into my second problem. Now, if you guys are looking for a tutorial video on how to be a key grip, this is definitely not one of them. Now, while we were moving on and transitioning from our interiors to our exteriors, we had to get rid of the stands, obviously. And one of the things that I did was I was trying to remove a C-stand in front of the window. Now, when doing that and removing the sandbag first and the knuckle was in the right place, I tried to lift up the sandbag and notice that the sand was going to hit the window and crack the window. And I didn't want to do that because whoever wants to be that guy on set. So what I did was I quickly tried to use a sandbag weight to actually bring the stand back in order to prevent it from hitting the window. I also didn't realize that I stood up at the same time. And if you can imagine what it's like to get a slingshot of a grip head to your face, that's exactly how you can get a black eye to get a black eye. Now, once this happened, my first thought was, is I think I lost my eye and I'm gonna have to go to an American hospital and I don't have health insurance. My second thing is, is did anybody catch that? Because that would have been a hilarious clip for this video. Nobody actually caught that footage. However, I did spend the rest of my day on set with a big black eye. I'll be I'll be back out in like give me like forty minutes. I'm just gonna ice on and off for it. Give me like twenty minutes. I just want to do on and off ice for a couple, and then make sure I don't swell up as badly. Uh, yeah, I was removing a sandbag off a C stand, but like it kind of hitched for a second, uh -huh. and then the weight came back on the sand the sandbag, and the whole stand hit me in the oh. face. So kind of a freak accident. I was like, usually it's super easy to do, but. I think it just caught onto something and kept me back in the face, so. Honor blue, we're not safe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a Connor blue sandbag, nor was it a Connor blue C-stand, so. Uh, but it was a Connor blue making C production. <laughs> I mean, it's not Condor blue making C-stands, question mark? Ooh. Condor blue no sandbag? No comment. Honestly, no comment. if I feel like if Condor blue made C-stands, it would be the most high-tech thing in the world. Oh, yeah. It'd be like one button, foot press, legs, it would also be a like, DIT station for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. It, it would like it would fold out into a, its own desk. It would it would somehow fit into a backpack. Like things in my ear. All right, so uh, as the key grip and the king of safety, I uh, was safely removing some sandbags from a uh, C stand. The C stand took a little little bit of a slingshot to my face, so I got a full uh, grip, kind of knuckle right to the uh, side of my face. So. It is that, but uh, you know what? It could have got me in the eye. It's a couple inches away from it, so we're okay. There's no open wound. I'm not bleeding, but uh, I would love some ibuprofen. I could go back out if I, you know, get a little bit of uh, something for the swelling, but who knows? I might have a giant black eye tomorrow, so we're not too sure. Oh, is there actually that? Perfect. Because uh, it's not free healthcare like there is in Canada, so if I got to go to the hospital, 
This is gonna suck. Now, the cool thing about being a key grip is that you're the key part. You're the manager of the situation, which means you get to delegate a lot. And in my Cyclops form, I just used the walkie talkie from one of the rooms where I had the ice in in order to make sure that we were still directing traffic and getting the things that we needed to get. And also I was right beside the truck. So if there was anything that was a dire need, I could always go and get that. However, that's how that third day went on set. I gave myself a black eye. I almost got threatened to get beat up, but we're a lot more confident. We have a system in place and everything went super smoothly. We were doing our night exteriors. We were doing our night interiors and everything was kind of the same as yesterday, just with extra steps and also with one less eye. Now, some of you guys might be new to a film set. You're gonna be working long hours. You might be working 10, 12, 14, or even 16 hours a piece. Now, our first day we were working one to one. Our second day was one to two. We even have a day where we're gonna be working from four in the morning till 5 a.m., which also means that we're probably gonna need a rest day. And we didn't really do a lot of resting. In fact, we, we went to Today is day number four, which is actually kind of a rest day. We're not on set, but we are doing a tour of the Condor Blue facility and we actually get to raid their closet and take whatever gear we want to set up our cameras. Uh, we're also gonna do a podcast a little bit later, but this is really cool because I get to see some of the accessories that Condor Blue actually has that I could set up for my Sony FX30 and my Komodo X for a little bit later. Condor Blue makes equipment for filmmakers. In fact, it's actually made by filmmakers for filmmakers. I did mention that I'm on the G&E team. I'm on the Grip and Electric. And I didn't mention that the owner of Condor Blue Lucas is actually the DP on set. So not only are we getting different accessories that are gonna help make our cameras look cool, but it's actually being made with filmmaking and the problems that we have in mind. And I'm gonna be the first person to say, Condor Blue accessories aren't cheap. And honestly, I don't think they need to be and I don't think they should be. They're incredibly high quality. They're easy to rig up. There's a ton of different variations for things. And also when you move from different systems, a lot of those parts carry over. It's made to solve the problems of people on professional sets. Camera rigs are meant to fix problems. And when you're working on set with a variety of different cameras, making sure that you have the proper cages and handles and cables and clamps in order to make sure that your rig is efficient and it's functional and you have everything that you need, Connor Blue provides that and I've rigged up all of my cameras since. Special shout out to them for actually sponsoring this video. We also got to check out the Condor Blue podcast studio. We actually did an episode as well, which I'm gonna leave in the description down below if you guys wanna see the full thing. Now, let me tell you, by the time it was shoot day number four, the hardest parts were over because this is actually kind of the more chill part about being a key gripper, being part of the G&E team. We actually spent the day at Blackstone Studios, which is actually owned by our gaffer, Chad, that was there on the first day. There's two psych walls on either side. There's a black psych and there's a white psych. Now, the way that we set up and the way that we rigged up the first setup was actually to have a green screen. Now, one of the scenes was gonna have a newscast scene. What we needed to do was make sure that the background was sort of how you would have in a normal news set. With the green screen, there's gonna be a little bit of background to make sure that we sell the effect. Now, the way that we did that was we did use big combo stands. Now, if you don't know what a combo stand is, it's kind of the evolved form of a C-stand, just like the evolved form of a light stand that you would get on Amazon would also be a C-stand. There was a bar going across, we hooked up our green screen, we made sure that it was high enough that it was out of the shot, but we also used sandbags in order to weigh down the green screen to remove any wrinkles. Now, when you're working on VFX and you're chroma keying things in post, one of the things you wanna do is to make sure that your green screen has as little wrinkles or as little different variations in the lighting as possible. Now, just like any other newscast, we did have a couple of different cameras on set. We're still using the Red Raptor and the Red Komodo X and even the original Red Komodo to function as a multi-camera interview that you would see on a talk show. Blackstone Studios actually had a system where you could live stream from a cinema camera. And they used two FX9 cameras in order to hook it up to Instagram Live so you could see a live behind the scenes as the film was going on. Now, if you guys were following it all on Instagram between the couple of days that we were shooting and you noticed that there was a gigantic psych wall and cameras everywhere, that was actually the FX9 connected to a computer program called Rubber Rubber Duck, I think. I don't know, I'll put it on the screen here. And that's a way that you can use your cinema camera or any other camera, hook it up to your computer and you could live stream behind the scenes. Again, we also had to be creators on set as well. So doing things like live streams and Instagram stories and getting photos and doing different posts on the day is one way that we actually got the involvement of different brands and helped out with the budget, which I'm gonna get into a little bit later, but just know that that also went into play, especially to show people exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. Now, David, who was actually on our g &E team and Brady actually set up the overhead lighting. And basically we used bounces in order to make sure that we got the look that we wanted. The cool part about being part of the g &E team is once you're done your setup, you're 
well done your setup. You might have to do a little bit of cleanup and making sure that the light stands are organized and making sure that things are on hand and ready to go. But once that's done, you're kind of like children. You'd rather to be seen and not heard. And, and actually, you probably don't want to be seen at all so you don't get in the shot. Now, this is actually a really chill day. And thankfully, this was an indoor location. And a special shout out to Blackstone Studios for actually letting us use this location to finish off the shoot. Now, I come from a city where there is a ton of studios, but I've never seen anything quite like this. Not one with two psych walls, not one with a full rental shop with a ton of different grip and electric equipment that are available. Now, if you guys are in the California area, you guys wanna go and check these guys out, I'm gonna leave a description down below. You could check out some of the things that they can do. And also, you've probably already seen the film already, so you can see how good it looks when it's all said and done. And it goes without saying that just because you're not behind the camera or you're not the director or you're not the big people that get in the headlines doesn't make you any less of a filmmaker maker being part of the grip and electric team now there's a couple of different things that i learned from this experience in terms of working in a new department and there's a couple of things that you should know just in terms of working a crew for the first time in general now the first thing is going to be don't be afraid to ask questions i came into the genie department not just as a grip but having to manage an entire team honestly not knowing my head from my elbow and one of the things that i did was i swallowed my pride and i asked questions even if it made me look stupid for me personally, if I'm in a situation that's a little bit new, I kind of abandon my ego and check it at the door because I'd rather ask questions and be embarrassed than make a call that was going to harm the production as a whole. Having people on set like our gaffer Chad, who was actually really informational and really helpful, and also helped me navigate a lot of the new naming conventions, and having Brady that was working with me for the next three days, and having the team of grips that we had on set as well, went a long way, and you feel a lot more confident when you have people that might know a little bit more than you, but also don't mind sharing that information, and or they're not after you to try to make you look stupid to really prove that YouTubers can't be filmmakers, because that's a little bull. The second thing is gonna be, honestly, make Google your friend. There were situations where people were asking me things on set that I just didn't know the names of or I didn't know what they looked like because they were new to me. So I went to the corner, I used Google, then I found it out for myself. And I'm not gonna take any shame in saying that if I don't know something, if I'm not gonna ask a question because I don't know and I don't wanna take up too much time, I'm honestly just going to Google it. Another thing is going to be thoughtful and sympathetic to the other people that are going to be on set. Now, when you're in a department, everything that you're doing is for your department first, but there's going to be other people on set as well. That might be getting water for your camera operator or Apple boxes because you have a couple short kings and queens that are operating on camera. It also might be getting snacks for different people on talent or the makeup crew or making sure that you're just useful to the team. Having a crew is to be on a team. And if you want to be a good teammate, you also have to do things that sometimes aren't exactly in your job description, which is more than fine. And it also makes things go a long way. And also you might make a new friend while you're on set. Another thing, and this is going to have to do a lot with the safety of being on the G&E team is one, make sure that your sandbag is always on the long leg. And two is make sure that the grip head, the knuckle part is going to be on the right side. That way, if the weight of the light goes forward, it'll actually tighten the grip and make it more secure. And if it's on the other side, then it'll go the other way. At one point, there was a gigantic debate about that. But even then, when you are removing the sandbag, just don't stand up. You might be able to save one of your eyes and not end up being a cyclops like me, which was most of the day. And the last thing, honestly, have fun. Truthfully, seriously. There's so many people that I know that come from the film industry that talk about how cutthroat it is, or if you make a mistake, you might never get hired again, or if you do something wrong, like you'll be scolded and shouted at. And honestly, maybe you're just working with a bunch of jerks. If you're gonna be working in any environment, and I'm sorry, I'm a grown ass man. If someone's gonna yell at me or talk down to me or be rude to me because I made a mistake, that's not an environment I wanna be at. Much less, I'm not gonna be able to take that very kindly. Having fun doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing things wrong. And also making mistakes and learning are part of the process. You're going to do those things. And if someone is going to absolutely lose their cool on it, maybe you're just working with some of the wrong teammates, which actually is a gigantic shout out to the crew that we were working with. We had more than 30 people on set and everybody worked really well with each other everybody got along there wasn't a sense of a hierarchy there wasn't this looking down at having youtubers on set we still had to be good crewmates but we also had to be good creators as well and honestly it was well recepted and i do think that this way is the way the production is going to go now my bonus tip for you is going to be making sure that all your memory is backed up which actually is going to be safe on the set now, all the red cameras we have only have one memory card slot, but we did have our DIT Armada who was making sure that everything was backed up and everything was good to go. And also we had a couple daily, so you did have an idea of how some of the shots were going to look. Now, making sure that things are backed up is gonna be one thing, but making sure that you have great cards is going to be another. And Angel Bird is actually going to be another sponsor of this video as well. Now, Angel Bird, I've used these cards forever. I have a CF Express Type 8 card right here. I'll just show you what it looks like. 
I've been using one of these guys on my FX3, my FX6, or any camera that actually has a CF Express Type A. I've also been using the CF Express Type B cards on my Red Komodo X and a camera that I haven't talked much about, but I'll probably get into a little bit later. Angel Bird has made incredibly solid cards that are high quality, they're super fast, and they're disruptors in the market because they are incredibly affordable versus a lot of the counterparts that are also available. Angel Bird hooked us up by kitting out all of the cameras we had with different memory cards to make sure that the information coming off the red cameras is on a card that it can handle, and at the same time, to make sure that things are secure and they work efficiently. A special shout out to Angel Bird for actually supporting the shoot. They've supported me in a lot of things that I'm doing in terms of the videos on this channel, and it's actually really nice that they were able to support a film production with so many crew and so many different creators, and also these cards can store a lot, which is probably why I have an hour recording this video, and I still have well, eight and a half hours left on a single card. Now, I've mentioned a couple times that the way the production and how YouTube is changing a little bit, and I'm gonna kind of explain how the makeup of the shoot actually was. Now, when doing an indie film or a short film or anything that's not gonna be headed by a gigantic studio, you're either gonna have to find the money in a couple of different ways. Either someone's gonna give it to you, you're gonna borrow the money, or you're gonna pay out of pocket. And oftentimes when you're working on independent film, you don't really have the most amount of budget in the world. Now, you guys might be sick of seeing five or six sponsors in the same video, but this does have a really important context. The way that we were able to support having 30 people crews and having two gigantic studios and shooting outdoors, renting a car, having talent, makeup, all of those things was actually on the backs of a brand deal and involving that into the budget of a film production in order to make everything happen the way that you actually see it now. For the longest time, there was this animosity between real filmmaking and YouTubers and social media people being on set. But the set that we worked at was proof that you could actually do both. We had a bunch of different YouTubers and brands making content on set while still getting things done, still being efficient and still being able to make an entire film in the course of a week. But at the same time, working with brands that make tools for filmmakers in order to show how things actually work in the field. This is going to be something that's going to be interesting going forward. And Crater, which is the agency that I'm a part of and some of these other YouTubers are as well, you're going to see more film productions just like these where brands are going to get involved so we can show how some of the tools work in the field. But at the same time, we still get to be filmmakers and YouTubers at the same time. Now, wrapping that all up and as I land the plane, I want to give a special shout out to the entire crew and all the other creators that were on this film set as well. I'm also going to give a shout out to the sponsors as well, and I'm going to leave everybody's links in the description down below. In fact, we do have a playlist where you can see every other creator that was involved in this production. You can actually see how the shoot went from a bunch of different vantage points. This is one of the first times I've been on a set like this with 30 plus people. There's YouTubers as well. And we still got to be able to do both between being a creator and being a filmmaker. And this is a place that I want to be in. It actually reinvigorates how I think filmmaking YouTube is going to go in the future. Now, if you're hearing a change in the music, it's because I'm no longer in Canada. In fact, I'm in Ghana, West Africa, which means, which means we're probably going to switch things up in the next video. But you're going to have to wait till then. So peace. Stronger, no weapon they form shall prosper.